Okay, so let's look at um, bonding in metals um, a little bit more. Whoops, that was actually not done intentionally. I was going to write bonding, right? And then I went in a little band. But actually, that's kind of uh, probably because I had band theory on my mind. <clears throat> so let's, uh, well, first of all, let's correct that. Let's make that an O. All right, there we go. And band theory is what we're going to talk about. And so this is a, a sort of a more refined model for the bonding in, in metals. Um, and it's going to be useful, though, for understanding electrical properties and even optical properties of ceramics, uh, metals, and, and uh, semiconductors. So what we, what we want to look at here is what we want to do is we consider, okay, we, we had, you know, we have some kind of a model of the atom like this, uh, and that's you know, roughly the Bohr model. Um, and we've got um, electrons defined by their energy defined by a principal quantum number. If you want to get a little more refined than that, um, you know, of course we could we could um, introduce the other quantum numbers. And often, instead of drawing the whole atom out, you just draw sort of a, a cross section through. You know, as if we we took a, a cross section through here. We're just looking at one dimension. So the nucleus could be down here. And then we're going to consider different energy levels increasing from closest to the nucleus. And so it's often written out this way. And yeah, I might have something like this n equals 1. Okay. And then, you know, you go up to a higher energy level and you've got uh, n equals 2. But I'm going to be a little more careful here. I'm going to go away from just the Bohr model and, and I'll, I'll go to our wave mechanical model. So we've got, um, we'd have 2s, in fact, and then we'd have 2p. And then we could go to you know, 3s and 3p and, and so on. Okay, I'm not being too careful with exactly where I sketched those, but that's the, the idea. They're in, increasing energy, uh, or sorry, well, yeah, increasing energy as they, they go away uh, from the nucleus. <clears throat> And that that was that's good. That's the that's our, our model for an isolated atom. Isolated atom. That means it's just just one atom sitting there all on its own. And that's what we've discussed so far. But we want to understand um, we want to understand solids. So this is the band theory of solids. So what we want to do is is, is we want to understand well what does this bonding here look like if we move into um, a solid. What if we, um, you know, have more than more than one atom? So we've got many atoms, and that's what what we're going to take a look at right now. We've got many atoms that we want to look at. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to sketch here. I'm going to have the number of atoms, beginning with one. Okay, one atom, and then we're going to go to say two atoms, three atoms, four, and so on, out to a lot. What's a lot? Well, I don't know. We'll call it a mole, right? You've got a, a huge quantity of atoms all close together. So this is one atom all on its own. This is two atoms close together. They'll be at their equilibrium interatomic spacing. You know, their attraction and repulsion is balanced. And what do the energy levels look like? And let's just look at a simple case um, of one energy level. Say it's 1s or something. So this is the energy level or the, the state available for uh, an electron. And so there's, if we're just saying, okay, compare this particular state, say it's 1s, then what happens when you get two atoms coming close to each other and their 1s um, electrons or the electrons in whatever state it is we're looking at get very close? Well, well they, they interact. And in fact, there's a splitting in the states. Um, such that they're not degenerate. They're not exactly the same energy. And if you go to three atoms close to each other, you'll have three states, four atoms, you know, you'd have four, and so on. Well, what if you had a mole of atoms? Well, I'm going to have to draw a mole of possible states. You know, and I'm going to be here for a while. <laughs> okay, I'm not actually. I'm going to just draw in a bit, and you get the idea, right? These... If I were to draw 10 to the 23rd lines here, it would certainly it would be it would be solid, the, the continuous uh, set of states. It's for all intents and purposes, right? They're they're continuous. The the spacing is so small 
between states, small spacing between um, between states that they all look like they blend together. They blend together. And what does that look like when you see them all blended together like that? Um, well, it looks kind of like a, a solid line. It looks like a strip or a band. And so this is, in fact, this band theory, or band model for the um, energy levels in, in a solid. Okay, so this is a mole. That means that's in the solid state now, in the solid state of matter. Solid liquid gas. We're looking at solids here. So this is the um, what uh, what we have to start looking at these these bands. <clears throat> and let's take a look at um, let's sort of make this a little more concrete. Well, actually, what I want to do for you first, I want to tell you. Okay, there's going to be three general um, forms of the band structure for solids that we observe. Okay, and let's take a look at the first one. Okay, so the first one uh, is characterized by the band structure that we find in copper. So let's look at copper as an example. Z equals, for copper, Z equals 29. And so let's uh, sketch out the electron configuration. It's 1s2. 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, and you remember then 4s comes uh, comes next upon filling, but I'm going to leave a little space. I'm going to put 4s there. When we start to fill 3d, okay, we have 3d. I wrote 3d before 4s because once you form the neutral atom, 4s is actually a little further from the nucleus, although it fills first. And this reminds us, if we ionize, if we formed a positive a cation of copper, we would ionize 4s first. But at this point, we don't really know exactly where to put these uh, these electrons. We, we should have filled 4s. So I'll go ahead and put 4s, but just don't stop the video at this point. Okay, if you've watched this far, watch a little bit further. And then we would think, okay, we're going to have 3d9, okay? And that would give us 29 electrons. The thing is, there's an interesting... Um, there's an interesting little um, uh, hiccup or a little special value, special case for uh, a low energy. So uh, three, it turns out that 3d10 is a slightly low energy, slightly lower energy than we would think it should be. And so in fact it, it's it's actually slightly lower energy than 3D9 4S2. Or I could be I could even add in 4S for you. 3D10 4S1. If we move one of these 4S electrons over to fill 3D, it's a lower energy configuration than what I've written there. So what I'm gonna do is now I'm gonna correct this. And I'm going to put in 3D10, completely filled 3D. And so what this looks like is it is it's a completely filled 3D. Uh, there we go. So we've got electrons spin up in each and then spin down in each. So completely filled 3D is especially just a slightly lower energy. Uh, and that's what occurs for copper. Um, it also occurs for chromium, except chromium, if you look at the electron configuration for chromium, chromium is 3d5, 4s1. Okay, so for chromium, it's going to have 3d5, 4s1, special low energy configuration. Anyway, so, so what we've done here, we, we've got the electron configuration for copper, and so let's take this electron configuration here. There's the valence electron. And let's take a look at what the band structure would look like then for, for copper, the copper band structure. Oh, you're going to have this. What's happened is as you get closer together, the 4s splits out into many, many different um, states and creates this band, this 4s band. Okay, so you're going to have this. Um, so 
what I'm drawing here, 4s band. But how many atoms can you fit into 4s? If that's 4s, you know you can fit spin up and spin down. But how many did we actually, um, how many did we put in, or do we have in, in 4s for copper? Well, we only have half of them. We have 4s1. So that means that, in fact, 4s band is, is only half filled. And so what that means is, and this is where how we apply the band uh, uh, theory, is it, all we need to do then is is excite an electron from one of these filled states up to this unfilled these unfilled states, and that makes that electron free, and it. It would then become one of the electrons that we would consider in that sea of electrons. It's free to conduct electricity. So <clears throat> there's no big jump the electron needs to make in energy level. It can just jump from, it can just hop from, from one of these filled states immediately to one of these unfilled states. And the energy required for that is very, very small. So it's very easy um, to excite an electron uh, into this um, into these unfilled states and make copper conductive. And, and so that's the band structure for copper. Now let's uh, take a look at another example. Let's look at um, magnesium. Okay, magnesium. So we're going to look at this one here for magnesium. And magnesium has atomic number of 12. So it's going to be 1s, one uh, direction 2. 2s2, 2p6, that's 10, um, 3s2. So the band structure then for magnesium is going to look like this. And I could draw the band here, the 3s. But of course, you see this time, 3s can, can, can contain two electrons, and we've got it filled. So we call this thing, um, this band here, we see we would say it described as being a filled valence band. And so you wonder, well, how are we going to promote electrons then um, and excite them and get them free to conduct? Well, there's, although it's not full, there's the 3p here, okay? I'm just going to put it in a different color, so we, there's no electrons in it. But 3p actually, as it gets close, see the way the band actually broadened out? So it looks like this, right? It broadened out as the atoms got close together. And so if the, say this is um, the, the 3s here, you know, for in our example, 3s, well, 3p can do that same thing and start to broaden out. And if it starts to broaden out, you may find that 3p overlaps with 3s. And in fact, that's exactly what happens here in magnesium. And so the 3s band correction yeah overlaps with the 3p and the 3p is empty and that's unfilled and so again we can easily promote or excite an electron from this valence band up into this unfilled band and that'll give us conduction it gives us a free electron when you promote it up into one of these unfilled states the last kind of band structure that we see and we'll follow up on this in a bit more detail is what we see in insulators and conductors, uh, sorry, insulators and semiconductors, and that's when you don't get this overlap. And so what you have is um, we have a filled valence band. And so then if you want to promote an electron, to a higher state, though, you've got to jump across these unallowed energy values. Okay, the unallowed energy values are an, uh, analogous to these spaces between n equals 1 and n equals 2, or n equals 2 and n equals 3. 
and then an electron cannot occupy those energy levels because energy is quantized. That was what we got from the Bohr model. And so similarly here, if we just if we uh, scroll down here, where were we? There we go. We've got unallowed values here that we have to jump across. Uh, in, in the electron would have to jump across those values in order to get into these empty states, which we we call the uh, so well. I'm going to write them here: empty states. Okay, empty states. But because they're empty states, and when they enter that and those empty states, they uh, uh, permit conduction. We call this the conduction band. And so to get from the valence band to the conduction band, and this is energy up this axis, if you want, in one of these diagrams, an electron would have to jump from one of these filled states up here across these values that are unallowed, forbidden. And so that gap in the bands is called the band gap. And in fact, we can, just to, to conclude this, we can describe uh, the, the band gap. We can, we can say, in fact, we can classify materials here and say if the band gap is less than two electron volts, we classify it as a semiconductor. If the band gap is more than two electron volts, it's an insulator. And if there's no band gap, as we saw here for copper and magnesium, for example, then it's a metal. Great.